Americans have been watching Batman movies off and on for the past 50 years. The only other character we've been watching for that long is James Bond. The same number of people have played both guys. Consequently, by examining the themes of a particular decade's Batman movie, you can construct a fairly accurate picture of what the average American's life was like at the time. They're like little time capsules wearing adorable rabbit ears. The original Batman TV show and subsequent feature film premiered in 1966, when America was feeling pretty goddamn good about itself. We'd bounced back from the Great Depression, successfully shamed Hitler into killing himself, and prevented the spread of communism into South Korea by hopping into a war that's still not officially over. We were much more into frivolity and irreverence, which is why 60s Batman is way more in common with Rowan and Martin's laugh-in than the brooding murder detective he had been in the comics of the 30s and 40s. He's a wealthy dude, kicking back and taking it easy, just like America was. Any crime fighting that happened was incidental to driving around in an awesome car and dancing with scantily clad women. He tells corny jokes, he hangs out in nightclubs, and generally just really enjoys being a 40-year-old man indulging in youth culture. Surely America had earned this, right? It was a rough first half of the century, but now we're all all about the good life. But that feeling started drying up as the decade wound down and Batman was canceled in 1968, just two months after the Tet Offensive. The first real evidence that maybe America wasn't gonna win this whole Vietnam thing. The same kids that watched Batman and were riding that America is awesome high protested the war two years later at Kent State and were gunned down by the National Guard. Two years after that was the Watergate scandal. Ever since, it's been real tough to feel ourselves on every level like we did when Adam West was doing the Batusi. We didn't see the Cape Crusader again until the 1980s in Tim Burton's Batman. Batman is set in a heightened reality during a time period that's deliberately ambiguous. The modern clothing and computer technology used by characters in the film stand in contrast to the old-fashioned automobiles and architecture that populate the city. All the mobsters dress like archetypal gangsters in a Dick Tracy comic and wield dated revolvers, except Bob. He packs a 45. Nobody f***s with Bob. Point is, the movie could have taken place in 1949 or 1989. It's pure escapism into a fantasy world, something that films of the 1980s represented more than any other decade in the history of cinema. The Cold War loomed above with the ever-present threat of nuclear war and communist invasion. The lower class is the poorest it had ever been. We'd just come out of a decade of gas shortages and terrorism, providing America with a sobering notion that the country could suddenly find itself at the mercy of a global community that seemed to grow more terrifying every day. The 1980s was a decade when people went to the movies to see Luke Skywalker and Rambo to forget about how bewilderingly powerless they suddenly felt. Tim Burton wove those elements into Batman by presenting larger-than-life characters in a time and place disconnected from the real world, yet still relevant to it. Batman Returns is a revenge movie, an indictment of the richest few Americans in the 1980s who became the wealthiest they had ever been in the history of the nation. Thanks, Ronald Reagan. The Penguin's mother and father are clearly portrayed as being part of this elite percentage of people in the short time they're on screen, and their defining action in the film is to throw their infant son into a river because he's deformed. This is a family that could conceivably have paid for any treatments or surgeries their son would need, but instead decided they would rather drown their child than live with his deformity. Later in the film, it's revealed that the Penguin's ultimate plan is to kidnap and murder all the firstborn children of Gotham, left home alone and unguarded while their parents attend Christopher Walken's costume party. And although we can hardly blame them, who wouldn't go to that party, I would go to that party, this suggests that the city's elite are more concerned with a trivial display of their status than the safety and well-being of their children. The Penguin himself is a manifestation of his parents' evil, and thus a manifestation of the evils of all the wealthy. His physical deformities are their moral deformities. Tim Burton is attacking the class of Americans that dominated the 1980s, and in doing so, he's expressing the frustration and resentment felt by the lower classes. And he was not invited back. Batman Forever was released in 1995, with an entirely new cast and a new director, Joel Schumacher. It came out in an America six years removed from the Cold War and four years from a massive victory in the Persian Gulf on a pretty big economic upswing. The nation was the most confident it had been in decades, and as such, audiences were less interested in the gothic fairy tale escapism of the previous two films and were much more into revisiting the campy self-indulgence of the 60s TV show, only this time starring a profusely nippled Batman with a borderline weaponized codpiece. Batman Forever is a product of an America running free after a decade of fear and financial strife. Well, it certainly is escapism, because superhero movies have difficulty avoiding that label. The film was produced at a time when the average audience didn't really have much to escape from. The mid-90s saw no great enemy and no great crisis. Batman Forever is escapism for its own sake, like when you go to a friend's house and they order pizza and you just jackhammer like five slices even though you ate before you came. Schumacher's next Batman film, 1997's Batman and Robin, goes even further beyond the pale of hedonism and absurdity. In fact, it went too far, blurring the line of ironic self-awareness so much that people didn't feel like spending their money on Batman movies anymore. Much to the woe of Pat Hingle. This is the hingliest movie series ever created. Christopher Nolan rebooted the Batman series in 2000 with Batman Begins, nearly a full decade after Batman and Robin. The American landscape had changed completely following 9-11. The country had been suddenly and violently pulled from the contented apathy of the 90s into a state of constant fear and panic over the threat of terrorism, and every movie in the Nolan series is a reflection of that. In Batman Begins, Ra's al Ghul's goal was the downfall of Western society, more specifically the punishment of Western capitalism. Liam Neeson is basically Al-Qaeda, 
if Al-Qaeda had ninjas in a giant microwave. Terrorists are also the villains in The Dark Knight and the final turd knot in the cinematic coil of The Dark Knight trilogy, The Dark Knight Rises. The Joker's a domestic terrorist, and like most domestic terrorists, he's the only primary villain in the series that isn't killed during his apprehension. The League of Shadows returns in The Dark Knight Rises with Bane and Talia al Ghul as their leaders, two delightfully accented global terrorists from a Far Eastern nation where everything exists in a perpetual shade of brown, the color America fears most. And that's what both America and Batman in the 2000s and onward has been all about. Fear. The plot of Batman Begins is about a terrorist literally using fear to destroy Gotham City. And outside of Batman, Alfred, Jim Gordon, and Hollywood's favorite plot de-ridiculizer Morgan Freeman, the only character to appear in all three films in the Nolan trilogy is the Scarecrow. He even becomes the judge of the Hunger Games version of Gotham City, which, whether intentionally or not, seems to be a reflection of the fear-based legislation that has plagued America since 2001. Then we got to take a four-year breath before experiencing Zack Snyder's Batman, and Batman v Superman, this title has too many words in it. He's older, tired, angry at all the criminals and superpowered terrorists that just seem to keep popping back up no matter what he does. Batfleck's grizzled, jaded worldview is the same as America's in 2016. We've spent a decade and a half fighting an enemy every bit as nebulous and decentralized as the criminality he's vowed to destroy. And just like America, he's willing to justify using more extreme methods to deal with them, including brutality and torture. Also. Batman is terrified of a future he imagines in which Superman has taken over. He spends the entire movie hating the Man of Steel for no real reason beyond the fact that he's an alien. Batman assigns his fears to Superman because he's a space immigrant that can't be trusted. And that's the sentiment bubbling in America and the post-Brexit world today, right down to us rooting for an unhinged billionaire who looks ridiculous, but pretends that he doesn't, and everyone else just sort of goes along with it. Can you imagine what Batman's tweets would look like? <sighs> it's gonna be a long four years. Of Justice League movies! Hey guys, thanks for watching that. Hey, did you know that monogamous sexual relationships are actually a recent development in human history? I know that's the sort of thing you typically hear from a 50-year-old guy with a ponytail who thinks all naked bodies are beautiful, but as someone who finds the naked human body gross and repellent in most of its forms, I'm here to tell you that science and sociology and history surrounding sex are actually really interesting, even to a person who's never been to an orgy. Anyways, that's not just a the more you know style public service announcement, it's what our live podcast is about this month. So Saturday, February 11th, 7 p.m., me, Michael Swaim, Teresa Lee are going to be talking to Dr. Christopher Ryan, who wrote a fascinating book about what sex was like a long, long time ago when humans were just starting to, you know. Tickets are $7. They usually sell it pretty quickly. So click on the link somewhere on your screen now if that sounds interesting to you.